creating something isn't easy, Dr. Paris. Creating things. That's sort of that's what you do. You create things. What I know about your story, you create things and you push boundaries. But I feel like creating things is pushing a boundary. And you've created a few things in your career, been, been involved. I wanted to start with something that's being celebrated here at APTA, which is um, the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy is celebrating being in existence for 50 years. And right. Right. You were at the foundation right. of that thing. 50 right. years is uh, is not a simple... Getting people together for once, one right. time. Right. Keeping people together for a year or two, not easy. 50 years. Yeah. You, you, must, have, you must have built a strong foundation when you started that thing. And it's not easy to be alive that long either. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you look at physical therapy back then, um, we were not really a profession. We were technicians. Our state boards... Uh, our education system was under the AMA. Okay. They controlled the content of our programs. We had to register under their medical boards, and um, we couldn't see a patient unless they made the diagnosis and the prescription. Wow. And then they came. We have no autonomy. So we did what the doctors told us. But I could see <coughs> the area of, say, respiratory therapy, all right? Um, that should have been part of physical therapy. But we were losing it to respiratory therapists because we weren't specializing. And we were losing sports to athletic trainers. I saw that at the ah. 1960 Olympics. I was in the New Zealand Olympic team as the physiotherapist. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was the first physiotherapist ever worldwide to an Olympic team. Wait, wait, for but any the, Olympic team? Any Olympic team. Hold on, wait, wait, we've got to stop there. 1960. You were the first physio to go to an Olympic Games attached to a, to a country team. and yeah. a team. As, I, as far as I know, that was a New Zealand team. Wow. Yeah, I had been an athlete in New Zealand. I swam for New Zealand universities, and I played rugby and did all the right things. I was a wrestler and a boxer and all of that. Yeah. So anyhow, I was on the team, but I went over to the American campus because they had athletic trainers. They knew how to tape patients' ankles. And I had a marathon runner who'd taken a small chip off the lateral malle malle eye in the ankle, and I needed some help. And uh, I got that help, but I could see that this is something physical therapists should be doing a better train fundamentally. And then I saw that we were losing hands to occupational therapists. Wow. So I thought, you know, we've got to specialize as a profession. And it was in the 1973 House of Delegates that they had a committee reporting to the House of Delegates that they had conducted a survey on the interest in specialization, clinical specialization. There was only two sections then, the education section and private practice. And the educationists didn't like the private practice section and thought that was corrupting the profession <laughs> to, to go into <laughs> private practice. Anyhow, uh, the report was going to report, and I heard it being read, <coughs> that there was no interest informing specialty clinical sections of an APTA. So this, everything we're yeah. seeing here, all 18 yeah. you know, sections e and academies. E exactly. None of those exist. Exactly. Well, I had a few years earlier, about 1967, approached the APTA to try and set up a section on manipulation, manual and manipular therapy. And they said no. A uh, section on that would probably lead to a section on massage, a section on ultrasound, and that's not the way to go. And I had to admit that kind of is a, a good argument. But anyhow, I formed the North American Academy of Manipulation Therapy. Now we had 942 members in 1973, more than the education section, more than the private practice. And they're about to report out that there is no need for clinical specialization. Well, I got the Massachusetts chapter was, was uh, to recognize me from the gallery. It's not a, that's an unusual thing. Right. You don't speak from the gallery. If someone objects, you can't speak. No one objected because I got to the microphone fast. Smart move. All right, <laughs> yes. And I said, look, we have 942 members, mostly Americans, some were Canadians. If you don't give us a home within physical therapy, we'll, we'll We'll have to do Splinter our own thing because yeah. already our members, we've got our own educational programs. We've got our own communication, a bulletin on orthopedics. Uh, you've got to give us a home. And so they defeated the committee's report, and I was invited to negotiate, and they gave us a home called orthopedics. So the following year, 1974, we founded the orthopedic section. And now, what, 18, 20,000 members. So 50 years, we celebrated it uh, this week. It was a lot of fun. How does that make you feel? Like, you were telling me the moment, yeah. not, not, I don't know if you've seen Hamilton, you were not only in the room that it happened, you were the guy at the microphone in yeah. the room that it happened. Yeah. To, to, to stand there last night in yeah. that room yeah. and watch students who might not understand where this is from, and that's why I like 
getting history from people who have right. unique, unique right. perspectives. Some of those students might not know history just because they weren't around. Right. But there's, they're benefiting from and they're becoming part of this thing that you started at a microphone 50 well, years ago. Well, they benefit from it, but I also think they should know it. Yes. Because I think that inspires them. Uh, one of the questions on a panel discussion yesterday was asked, you know, how do you feel about the future of, of physical therapy? Uh, where do you see it going? And uh, there were various comments from the panelists, and it got to me, and I said, well, I'm very bullish on it. I didn't use that word. I said I'm, I'm very uh, excited about it. I, I'm very positive about it. Good. Because when I look for how far we've come to where we are now, mostly autonomous, right. not needing a doctor's prescription, all right, uh, we've come a long way. So I'm sure we're going to handle the future just as well as we've handled the past. Yeah. I even went back and said, you know, uh, for, as I was answering that question, I said, my father before me was a physiotherapist. No, I said he wasn't. He was a mass sewer and medical electrician. Huh. But that became the school of medical gymnastics, which became the school of physiotherapy, which is synonymous with physical therapy. Yeah. So we've come an awful long way. Yeah. By the way, Dad had six months training out, straight out, and he never had finished high school. Wow. <laughs> he was a veteran in the First World War. Was he influential in your decision? Was, did that plant a seed for you? I, when you in New Zealand, at, at my time, you went from high school into the mining school, engineering school, medical school, physical therapy, whatever you were going to do, you did it straight after. No years in college preparation. I didn't know what to do with my life, but there was my father. He had his office. We called them rooms on the front of our house. We, we lived well. We had two houses, uh, vacationed. I had a handicapped sister, and she was in a private school and got all the help she needed. We had to pay for most of that. So, but Dad, as a physiotherapist, could manage it. So, you know, it seemed like a good career. Yeah. So I, I drifted into it. But within six months, I accidentally manipulated a patient on the gymnasium floor when I tried to get one leg over the other because he couldn't do it and his back cracked. And uh, I, I got in trouble from the supervisor who was watching me as a student. And um, that was on a Friday. I worried all weekend, you know, who is he in the hospital? <laughs> how, do, how do I go there and apologize to him? But on Monday, he didn't turn up to the class. The next, we treated patients in classes, knee class, hip class, back class, exercising on the floor. He didn't, he didn't show up. But 15 minutes later, he came bounding in, shook my hand, thanked me for fixing his back. Wow. It, it's one of those rare events. But right. manipulation is associated sometimes with dramatic results. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, what's this about? And he said, well, that's manipulation. And I said, are we going to learn that? And he says, no, that's no, chiropractic. I said, that seems wrong, you know. And he said, yes, it is. He says, look, here's my books. And he showed me several books by Syriax, Manel, and others. He said, I purchased these books. I've read these books, but I had no instruction. I'm too concerned. I, I don't want to do that on patients. I'm doing okay without it. I don't want to take that risk. Right. He said, but son, if you want to specialize in that, if you want to do that, I'll support you to travel overseas, provided you bring it back and teach it. Wow. And so, yes, that's what I did. So he was like your 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 sponsor, your yeah, guidance counselor. Yeah, he was. I don't really appreciate his value at the, at the time of his life as much as I do now. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> someone asked me, uh, a, a, a recent hire asked me, how do we spell orthopedics that way? It keeps coming up. When I type it on Microsoft <laughs> yeah, yeah. Word, it's, there's a little red <laughs> squiggle. Yeah. And I like when there are little, we call them Easter eggs, <laughs> yeah. things that you hide in a movie yeah. or a game. Yeah. And they kind of they make it a little more special. So a why, do, why well, do we spell orthopedics? Well, like that? you know that was one of the silly things we debated. Uh, we debated how should we spell the word orthopedics, and I led the charge for the present spelling P A E, uh, and I said, well, firstly, the American Academy of Orthopedics is spelled that way, so there's a good lead. We want to relate to them. We're working in, in their domain. The next, I said, I think orthopedics is a noun and with an e. It's a verb. Okay. And I wasn't sure what I was saying, <laughs> but no one else was sure. Who's going to that's that's challenge you, you? That's how you win arguments sometimes, <laughs> by, by saying it with confidence. Say it with your chest yeah, out. Well, I wasn't too sure. Right. <laughs> and no one's ever corrected me since yeah. on that. I kind of like that. I, the, I asked it, and then because it, it promotes a question, mm -hmm. and when, then someone gets to answer it with mm -hmm. a bit of history. Mm -hmm. Not a chapter, not mm -hmm. a book, a mm -hmm. bit of history. It might make them want curious enough to ask more right. about that and when someone leans in so i like when people ask that you know originally i was like we got to change it. that doesn't make any sense yeah. and then i heard the story behind it and i said 
Well, now we can't change it because it has a story. It has meaning. There's, there's, it's anchored in something. Well, it came up some 15 years ago in a, in a meeting. Someone asked, why do we spell it that way? And they said, well, uh, Stanley Paris, the first, he, he said, we have to spell it that way. Mm -hmm. Everyone laughed, and that was the, <laughs> that was the answer to his question. Uh, you, you and I uh, got to interact uh, with another organization within APTA, within the profession. Yes, we and do. And that's the Foundation for Physical Therapy yeah. Research. Thank you for being there. We need some young blood. I, I, I think it's, it's only hopeful, right? So how would you explain in a sentence or two what the foundation, why it exists? What, what is its purpose? Well, I, I think the, the founders, Charles Magistro and a, another couple of guys, um, they knew that we had to prove our value. I mean, the way we were taught was from a couple of textbooks. They had no references in them at all. Uh, there was no research in those days. Right. And our teachers didn't do research. Right. So everything was uh, what they knew in their heads and, and these couple of books. And they would pass it forward. They passed it on. And, and that was the Bible, if you like. Um, but the early founders, they appreciated that, you know, we didn't have evidence for what we did. Right. We, we were into the latest fad, be it hot packs or ultrasound or whatever it was, PNF. And we, we did it almost exclusively, like we threw everything else away and just adopted the latest fad. Right. Well, anyone could see that that's not good practice. No. Uh, so where's the evidence? How do we know what's the best practice? So, and today we're fully into evidence-based practice, you know, three-legged stool, I believe, and all that sort of concepts. But you have to invest in that. <clears throat> you have to encourage your fellow members to get into it. So the Foundation for Physical Therapy was founded, it's now called the Foundation for Physical Therapy Research. We added the word research to it, which has always been in our blood. And uh, we started sponsoring research from those inclined to, to, to get their PhD in the research and, and carry on that way. Yeah. It's greatly strengthened the profession. And now today we're coming out with reports on the, the value of physical therapy. And we're adding uh, th that to in the foundation now. We're going to encourage future researchers to try and show the, the economic value of what they're studying. Now, that's right. not going to be easy for many researchers. They, they like to see the effectiveness of something over something else and so on. But we have to also look at the economic value. And I feel particularly if we can get that economic value to Medicare, for instance, and then to the, the, the uh, not the payers so much, but the public itself, they start seeing where the economic value is and they'll, they'll pay more attention to physical therapy and physical therapists themselves will be doing those things more efficient to the patient. Yeah. So I, I think that's important. Yeah. Our biggest problem is with the payoffs. Okay. The payoffs, <laughs> it's a cost of health care. They, they make 15%, 20% profit. Well, they angle at that. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Nothing wrong with that. That's capitalism. That's how the world works. But there's no incentive for them to save money because if the cost of health care goes up, their 15% goes, goes up. up. So something was once a million, now it's two million, and, and they were making 150,000, now they're making 300,000. That's a good game to be in. Well, yes, it is, the but there's no incentive for them right. to work hard to bring down the cost. There's no incentive for them to say, wait, don't go in for that total hip or total knee. You've got to have six weeks physical therapy first. Then you might be a, a candidate right. for that. And what I'm speaking of now is New Zealand and England. You can't go, in New Zealand, for instance, you as an individual cannot go straight to an orthopedic surgeon wow. with your complaint of hip pain, have him or her take an X-ray and decide to do surgery on you. Until? The, the only people who can send you to a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, is your family practitioner or the physical therapist. And usually there's a six-week trial period of physical therapy in there before you can get that surgery. And that takes care of, that delays and delay itself may take care of some complaints and that gives the therapist a chance to show their skill and on many patients it, it saves a lot of money for the country. So under a socialized healthcare system, there is an incentive for the government to, to do save the money. Thing that saves money. Now that same incentive should exist within Medicare because that's socialized right. medicine. We pay for it. Yeah, we. But, but so we don't have a, a terribly functional government, <laughs> Congress when it comes to recognizing that and making those changes. Right. They're more into other things. Yeah. But, but that's where we would have a toe in the door increasingly if we can show the economic benefit of physical therapy. And APTA started to do that, and now the foundation's going to try and support that 
by trying to encourage the researchers of this profession to address that wherever they can. Yeah, funding research and yeah. Yeah. helping to right. curate research herbs. Right. We want physical therapists right. doing right. the research, to right. be a part of doing the research. Right. And to do that, you have to invest in people and projects. Yes, and that's giving us the value of the profession today. We're, we've shown our effectiveness. Now we've got to show our cost effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, last thing I'll bring up is you got together with a bunch of people. We're talking about the history, right? I feel like this conversation we're having is very historical based, but also looking to the future. You talked with a, a, um, a panel uh, about orthopedics and, and the history. What are some things that, uh, that you shared there that you remembered that uh, brought up fond memories or maybe things you didn't know? Oh, I can't think of an answer to that right now. All right. Well, what, what excited you about talking on that panel and being with those, those fellow panelists? Well, it's an honor to be on a panel with the talent that was on that panel. Who else was there? Bob Rowe was there. Uh, Bob Rowe, uh, he chaired part of the panel discussion. There was uh, Jan Richardson, right. uh, who's past been a president. past president, but also a president of APTA, as pre well as president of what we now call the Orthopedic Academy. Um, and, and then there was um, Justin Moore, the executive director of APTA. Yep. Uh, there were people of that of that talent there. Yeah. Quite a few. Yeah. If you would if you would impart because I mean students make up a, a lot of the energy right. here. I'm trying to steal some of that energy from them. I'm not sure how I directly get it from them, but I'd like to have some of their energy. Right. If you would give them one thing that they should be thankful to look forward to in the profession, what is the message you usually share? Um. Well, we what we heard a lot of was burnout. Yeah, we had a conversation not long ago about that. Yeah, and it troubles me to hear that because I've never, never experienced burnout. I mean, I won't say every day I got out of bed excited to go to, go to work, <laughs> but I never got out of bed saying, oh, gosh, I can't go to work. I don't want to go to work. I'm, I've had enough. I, I always saw the value of what we do and, and uh, of how we help people. And I, would, I believe in continuous quality improvement. So as long yeah. as I was a a clinician, and even when I became an educator, I wanted to improve what I was doing each time because I knew I could. And I knew that would benefit my patients, my students, more so if I kept, kept that in mind. And I believe in the value of what we're doing. I mean, as I've said on many an occasion, medicine and surgery may save lives, but no one speaks to the quality of those right. lives better than does physical therapy. Right. I believe that. And how can I burn out when I believe that, right? We have, we have too much, too many people we lose um, in this profession, uh, particularly female therapists, which we, uh, 80%, I guess, are, are female, maybe not quite that now. But they start having a family, and then they don't return to the profession because it seems like an, an obstacle to return, or right. whatever reason it is. But we lose a lot of talent in that. And uh, it's not just the United States. We, I'm, I'm very much engaged in physiotherapy in New Zealand. We have the same problem there. Huh. Now, the average uh, is about eight years, and we lose them. Wow. Yeah. Well, it sounds like for you, your strategy to avoiding burnout was paying attention to your North Star, which was the thing that drove you, was, right. was providing great care. Right. And what we hear a lot of times, we heard a conversation with a young female therapist right. on, you know, here on this show, and that was ultimately the thing that she did to get her back on track. So she was right. about to leave. She was about to right. do exactly yeah. what you said, run yeah. away. Yeah. And she said, I stopped and thought about what it felt like the first day as a physical therapist and why I did all the things before that. Right. And that didn't fix it, right. but it was the first step in saying, okay, now what can I control and what, I, what can't I? Right. Well, might as well just delete what I can't control because I'll erase it. Can't, can't change it anyway. Mm -hmm. And she focused on those things. But the first thing she said was mindset. It sounds like you had that mindset. Right. I come to a conference like this. I select which sessions I go to. I get new ideas I want to try. And I hear new research that needs to be tried or validated. Yeah. And uh, things I think I can do that I haven't been doing. Yeah. I, I always got material from, from these meetings. Yeah, took a lot of things out. I mean, yeah. these meetings are three days long. What do you do in the other 362 days a year? Take what you have here. Try it out, right. see what you get. That's right. what research is, right? And, and enjoying the weekend. And enjoying the weekend. <laughs> uh, we wrap each episode up with what we call the parting shot. What's an idea, a sentiment, a mic drop moment, or a soap? What's something you'd want to leave with the audience with as we wrap up? Oh, I probably said it already about our value. Yeah. Uh, we, we do improve the quality of people's lives. Yes, we do. I, I think we are an underappreciated profession by the public, they beginning beginning to hear more about us. 
we keep saying we're going to have an oversupply of physical therapists. <laughs> no, we, we, can't, we can't fill that market right. because the, it's a growing market because the public are continuing to see more and more value in our practice and our autonomy where we can reach out into many other areas has added to the, the future growth and perspectives of physical therapy. So as we get recognized more and more, I, I think our influence is going to grow. I look forward to the day when we become the primary care physicians of the musculoskeletal system. Yeah. That when you have a, a pain in the musculoskeletal, which is the largest system of the body, when you have a dysfunction, y your first thought is not going to be going to the doctor to get a medication or the surgeon to get it replaced. It's going to go to the physical therapist yeah. because we've got to, I mean, we're going to live longer. That's great. Oh, it, it, but So what do you want, every joint to be a metal joint? Right. Um, th they're great, great surgical uh, interventions now for knee and hip as opposed to, say, 15, 20 years ago. But still, I don't have a, a metal joint yet, and I do my best to resist it. Good. I want to walk through the airport without the alarms going off. Yeah. Well, looking forward yeah. to that day. I think that's, some, that's, a, that's a perfectly great North Star <coughs> to keep our eyes on as we, as we sail into the future. So I got the sailing reference in there. Dr. There you go. Uh, Stanley, appreciate it. I know you're very vis uh, busy at a conference like this, so appreciate the time. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you for what you're doing.